my feet I can feel the breath of those surrounding me I can hear the sound of nations rising up we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome I can walk down this dark and painful road I can face every fear children singing out we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome same power that rose Jesus from the grave the same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us lives in us the same speaks the same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us lives in us he lives in us lives in us we have hope that his promises are true in his strength nothing we can do yes we know there are greater things in store we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome the same power that rose Jesus from the grave the same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us lives in invite you to turn in your Bibles uh, with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We're nearing the end of our study in the book of Ephesians. I have a couple of more weeks um, in this text. Uh, next week we're going to uh, have a sermon that Pastor Jeremy's going to preach. It'll be a little different 
I'll be on a different topic, a uh, topic I've asked him to address. I think you'll find it very beneficial, uh, more of a refreshing type sermon, and uh, that's kind of where he's coming at it from, uh, that God's burden is easy. Uh, and so uh, that'll be next Sunday. As for this Sunday, we're still in the book of Ephesians. As we've gone through the book of Ephesians, I've uh, discovered a thought to myself that how appropriate this is right now for our society and for the church. The first part of the book of Ephesians established very clearly that Christ did a work on our behalf. He did it before the foundation of the world. And that he did a work that has given us great blessings. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. We as Christians are greatly blessed and we ought to live in light of that. I believe we ought to have that realization every day. Every time we feel like saying, woe is me and life is so hard. We ought to remember that we have the riches of Christ, not only now, but even more so later on. So the first three chapters establish our identity in Christ, our oneness in Christ, what he's done for us. Beginning with chapter four, what we have is the idea that we are to maintain that unity, uh, maintaining the unity of the spirit. So the spirit provides it. We're to do it in the bond of peace. What a wonderful verse. Maintaining the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Yet if you go out into society and even into many churches, that kind of saying is not really playing out. That truth isn't playing out. The unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Even last week we had some riots in our own city. And it's frustrating to hear about how that people care so little about each other. Uh, without even knowing their cause, they just want to riot. And I believe that we ought to protest. I'm a, a very strong uh, advocate of standing up for the sake of righteousness, standing against the evils of the day. But I am not in favor of how people have been treating each other. And it's not just in our society. It happens in our churches. No wonder then we have the book of Ephesians telling us how we ought to act within the church. Since the tendency of humanity is for us to become selfish and overlook people and to mistreat other people, um, God admonishes us, hey, he looks at it all different. His economy, so to speak, his set of responsibilities, how he views life is very different than how we view life. And so we come to Ephesians chapter 4. And we begin a process talking about how we should relate to one another. Maintaining the unity that's been provided by God. As we worked through it, we saw a lot of different uh, aspects to maintaining this unity. Telling us to be kind and, and gentle and patient. Uh, telling us that we're to seek out God's will. That we're to discern how God would have us to act. Uh, urging us to be moral in our lifestyle, make moral choices, because even though at times we uh, fool ourselves into thinking, well, it's my life and it only impacts me, no man lives to himself, no man dies to himself. And so the decisions we make make a difference in other people's lives, even morally. And so we're urged by God in the writings of Paul in, in the book of Ephesians to make sure that we live these clean lives. And Make sure that we're discerning how God would, would have us to live. And so we're to wrestle with how would he uh, want us to act? What would he have us to say? What choices uh, does he want us to make? In light of that, we're urged then to walk in wisdom. Now wisdom goes hand in hand with the word of God. Because that's where we find the wisdom that we need in order to live the Christian life. Not only that, but we're urged to walk in, in the the Spirit, that we're to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And so with those things in mind, we have these urgings in, the, in this passage to, to discern um, what is from the Spirit, what is the Word of God, what would God have us to do. And so we're to sing to each other, we're to minister to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. And so even privately, 
our worship to God, and then we're to submit to each other in the fear of God. This idea of mutual submission is a difficult idea to wrestle with. When I think of mutual submission, I think about when we go out to eat with a group of friends here in Lancaster County, uh, the, the waitress will come up and say, you know, how many checks will this be? Or how many bills should I? And, and so it starts. No, I'll take the bill. No, I'll take the bill. Someone else will say, I'll take the bill. Before you know it, there's this kind of a nice argument kind of thing going on. And then somebody sneaks up to the cash register and pays everybody's bill. Well, I found a way to, to get out of that argument. I just say, okay, you can pay the bill. I'm kidding. But it's these nice kind of arguments where we're trying to mutually submit and care for each other. That's a good thing in a lot of ways. But it's not really what God's asking us to do, to fall over, all over ourselves to try to make sure the other person lets you take care of it. God tells us what mutual submission looks like. And so last time I, I preached from a difficult passage, not difficult because this church doesn't accept it, not difficult because I think this church thinks it's controversial. I don't think they do, but difficult because I know societally uh, it's not politically correct for me to say that a wife should submit to her husband. And yet that's what God describes when we come to the end of chapter five. You see, mutual submission looks like this, that wives are to submit to their husbands and husbands are to lovingly lead. And so there's a yielding of the wife to the husband and there's a love from the husband to the wife. That's a mutual submission. That's what it looks like. He should be the leader of the home. He should be setting the pace. She should be letting him do it. All of it's done in love. We have there a mutual submission. It doesn't end there, though, because we're in an, uh, a section of Ephesians, which we could properly call a household code. And as we take this household code and work through it, we see how different people are to act. And so it's, it's done by two, husbands and wives. And then we get to chapter 6, which is where we're at today. Children and fathers, and it mentions the mother too, so children and parents. And then the last one are masters and slaves, which is very controversial subject to even come upon because then does the Bible support slavery? Well, let's address that a little bit as we come to it. The first couplet that I'm going to look at is this, that there should be a relationship between the children and the parents which shows the kind of submission that God expects. This is what God asked for. It's what he demands. It's how he laid it out. It's what he expects within his system of responsibility. And in verse 1, it says it very plainly. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Here's the right thing to do. Children, you are to obey your parents. Um, there's not, not a lot to uh, debate about this. Uh, it's very clearly stated that obedience from the child is expected uh, from the parent. Even societally, in a society where so many people are trying to raise our children for us, daycares are raising them, and I know by necessity for some families. I understand that it's difficult to live in a, in a one-income home, but we ought to, to really keep keenly in mind that we as parents have the responsibility to raise our children. We don't, we don't hire people to raise our kids. Um, we can participate with family. I mean, that's important. Now, you might hire people, but I'm saying you should raise your own kids. And, and how you do that is going to depend on the, the stewardship of your life, what situation you're in, what's your financial status. But don't absolve yourself of the responsibility to raise your children for the Lord. So here it is that the children are to obey their parents in the Lord. So children, here's a way you can worship God. Uh, you can obey your parents. Have you ever considered it that way, that this is an act of worship? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. God is pleased with that. When children obey their parents, and parents, that leaves an obligation for you, and that is to love your children. And so the ver second verse goes on to, to say for the child, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. So in obeying your parents, we have the obedience part, which is very different from what we see with the husband and wife because she's not to obey him. She's to yield to his leadership. 
But here children are to obey. There's to be an obedience. But secondly, there's to be an honor towards the father and mother. There's to be this respect. Um, this applies even if you are an adult. The Bible makes it clear that there was a failure among some adults in Israel during the life of Jesus that were not taking care of their parents. They were trying to set aside money that was special investment money or for the church. And so I can't use it to help mom and dad. And Christ rebuked them. And so we know very clearly that the honoring of the father and mother goes on even through adulthood. There should be a respect and honor given. Um, how you talk to them. What you do for them. How you treat them. Um, what you might help them with financially. Is there an honor? Is there a respect for, for them in relationship to your parents? This command then comes with promises. Now keep in mind that when this first came, it came to Israel who was promised to be in the land. And if they would obey God, they would be long in the land. If they would disobey God, they would lose the land. And so parts of this apply to Israel uniquely, but the principle is still true that we will live a peaceful and prosperous life if we are doing things the way God has asked, to do it, asked us to do it. This verse, verse 3, says that it may go well with you that you may live long in the land. It comes from Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12 where we have the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is given you. But the problem with this verse, and it's not really a problem, it's, is that it's not the first commandment in the Bible. It's not even the first commandment in the Ten Commandments. So how does it, how does it apply here when it says that this is the first commandment with promise? Well, it is the primary commandment that's given to a human being as they're raised. This here is the one you need to learn right off the bat. Honor your father and mother. And if you would do that, if Israel would do that, they would be long in the land and they would be prosperous. We can apply it to ourselves that we will be blessed if we do things in the way God has asked us to do that. And so in relating with each other, children and parents, you've got an obligation. But now the fathers doesn't point out the mothers here. It did talk about the mothers because the children are to obey the mothers and the fathers. But in verse 4, there's a special little phrase put in there. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Images come up of the dad picking on the child, um, teasing them, uh, knowing the thing the child doesn't like, and, and getting the child angry. Even as I say these things, I can imagine some wives poking their husbands uh, and saying, that's what you do to the kids. You tease them too much. Well, that, this might apply to some of that, but I think there is a tendency by some fathers to be overly harsh with their children, overly demanding to the point where they crush them. Listen, parents, it's not our jobs to crush a child, to take away their personality and their drives. We're to direct them in the way that they should go from the book of Proverbs. Um, and so we're to direct them according to their bent. Meanwhile, fathers, do not be so overbearing that you're provoking your child to anger. Fathers, do not prov provoke your children to anger. Don't cause them to be angry. Now, they make the decision themselves, but the provocation was provided by you. It could be provided by the mother as well, but apparently it was a bigger problem in that culture uh, that the father was overbearing. And so it's the unreasonable demands of the father, uh, the petty rules or favoritism. Uh, such actions like those have caused children to become discouraged. Colossians says it a little bit differently than Ephesians. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And there's been many a child who has carried this discouragement even into adulthood. But we, Christian, know better. Let us not be overbearing to our children, but instead bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Love them in the way God loves them. Love them in the way that God wants them to go. Direct them by the teachings of God's word. Instruct them in those things. So we have the first couplet, children and parents. The next one is a little more difficult. 
It's the bond servants. So we looked at children, fathers, now bond servants and masters. They go together. Now it was in this culture that slavery was a thing. As the Apostle Paul is writing to them, he's not encouraging them to become slave owners or to become slaves. But it was a reality. By the way, it's a reality right now. Maybe more of a reality than it's ever been. On the, on the face of the earth, estimates uh, have come in up to 40 million plus people who are enslaved. And it's not just around the world. It's in the United States of America. And it's not just the out there kind of things. It's in the state of Pennsylvania. And it's not just all the other cities. It's in Lancaster. You might be thinking in different ways than what I'm addressing, but I'm talking about uh, the sex trade. I'm talking about uh, enslaving people. The bulk of the people enslaved right now are women and children. And it's happening all around us. I have a friend that works uh, fighting this in the Lehigh Valley. And it's a very big industry, and it's, it's uh, destructive, and it's horrifying. This passage is not encouraging any of those kinds of things. In fact, a lot of what was going on in this Roman culture was a healthy relationship between the master and the bond servant, where they would go home at night, they would have families, they would be provided an income, and most of them were, were released from, from their uh, commitment by the age of 30. Now, I'm not saying none of them were mistreated. It was a horrifying environment for uh, someone who was considered a servant or a slave. Uh, for some of them, not all of them. Uh, it was a horrific thing here in the United States because slavery was absolute bondage. It's not exactly what was going on in the Roman culture. Since many of them were set free at the age of 30, so much so that there had to be an edict declared that only so many could be uh, set free every year because there were so many slaves being set free. It was overwhelming their society. Whatever the case, the Word of God is not here encouraging slavery. It's not sanctioning it. It's just, it's just recognizing what was happening around the world then and even happening around the world now that there is an issue with slavery. Well, in that culture, it was saying to the slaves, here's how you can act to be pleasing to God. Even though you're in a a, a bad situation. Some of you, it's not so bad as others. Some of you, it's absolutely horrific. But if you're in that situation, here's how you should act towards your masters. It says this in verse 5, bond servants. And then we have a series of six statements made. Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. And so it's the idea of respect and fear. Those over uh, this person um, in authority. Secondly, the, the slave was to, to do what they did out of sincerity of heart. It says it this way, with a sincere heart. It was to be sincere. It wasn't to be fake. They weren't to be fraudulent. They weren't supposed to be just putting on a show while they were seen uh, trying to fool people. Thirdly, as if they would obey Christ. It's hard to think of it this way, but we could be obedient to those over us and use it as an act of worship. In other words, worshiping God by how we interact with each other. Uh, fourthly, not simply to make a good impression. Uh, it says in verse 6, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but to do it as a bondservant of Christ. Again, as an act of worship uh, to God. Next, it's not to, to be done uh, in deceitful ways, but with sincerity of heart. Doing the will of God from the heart. And so God's expecting us to act a certain way towards those who are in authority of us, though we don't wrestle with the issue of slavery right here in this church as we are. There are some who do. And again, it's not saying just obey your slave owner. It's completely against the law here. I think it should be fought against. I think it should be identified. But when we find ourselves in, in situations of servitude, there is a way that we can act and react and respond, a sincerity of heart. And then lastly, with a good attitude, rendering service with a good with goodwill as to the Lord and not to man. And so we're doing what we're doing mostly because it pleases God. And so I believe God gives us indications in there, whether we wrestle with this issue of slavery personally or not, we know that there's principles here that could apply. 
This is how we ought to act towards people in authority. Even though that's not specifically what this is talking about, we could look back all the way from chapter 4 up till now and see the same things reiterated over and over. This is how you act towards each other, regardless of your situation. You're to be respectful. You're to be kind. You're to be gentle. You're to be patient. You're to consider that you're doing what you're doing as an act of worship to God. And you want God to be pleased with how you act, no matter what situation you're in. And so it says in verse 8, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. So there's a motivation. Verse 8 is a motivation. Do what you do, because God's asked you to do it, and you want God to be pleased. But God also is blessing you. Now your situation, some of you may be in a very difficult situation right now. Know this, that your blessings will far outweigh the hardship of life that you might be going through. You may have a boss who's a complete idiot. You might have to, to work with people who are very difficult and oppressive, who threaten you or give you a hard time. But know this, that there's a time coming when you're going to experience the blessings of eternity. And it's going to far outweigh what we have here. And it is God is, that's the one that will bless. There are those who are blessed here on earth for a time. They live a life of ease and maybe abundance. And maybe you don't have that. Well, embrace where you're at. Work within the boundaries of where you are, who you are, what your responsibility is. And do what you can do to be pleasing to God, knowing that God will one day bless you. Verse 8. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. God is the one that blesses both of them. It goes on to talk about to the masters. So obviously there were slave owners that, or masters, maybe is a better word for this in that culture, um, that were believers. And there was a responsibility from them as well. That they were to treat the slaves in the same way, by the way, that God tells the slave to treat the master. It says it this way. Masters do the same to them. So whatever I just said to you. Here's how those who are in authority should act towards others. There's an interaction. There's a mutual submission going on. There's consideration for each other. Masters do the same for them. Stop your threatening. Don't threaten people. By the way many of us feel in bondage to our jobs. And. And some bosses would, would threaten, hey, if you're late, you lose your job. Or if you do it this way, or if you don't uh, make enough widgets uh, within an hour, then you're going to lose your job or we're going to dock your pay. Or you can't call in sick, um, a coerciveness uh, that would say, if you call in sick, I'll give someone else the job or whatever. There could be threats. There could be um, difficult situations. Don't do it. If you are a slave owner, you shouldn't be. But if you're in a situation where you're in authority, how you should act towards other people is the same way that God expects them to act toward you. The verse ends this way, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there is no partiality with him. Listen, God's not tricked. He's not fooled. He knows the value of a soul. There is no one person more valuable than another. God knows it all and he knows who he will reward and how he will reward them. And so keep your eyes fixated on the fact that God is the best rewarder, the true rewarder, and the one that is not partial. So I was watching a video of uh, a lady who had stopped at a red light, but she had stopped over the crosswalk, as many of us have done at different times. You didn't really stop in time, and so... The car was over the, the crosswalk. So if you were walking across, the car was there. And I watched a lady walking across the crosswalk. And this was, has been during this time of rioting, etc. And so the lady walking along walked up, walked up to, to the SUV and started screaming and yelling at the lady. Kicking her truck, smashing her purse into the window. She got the door open, which I'm not sure why it was even unlocked. But she got it partly open in the lady in the SUV got it closed again and then, you know, saying curse words to the lady and everything because she was on top of the crosswalk. And then as soon as the light went to turn green, the lady just quick walked around the front of the car and got on. I mean, she wasn't that far over the crosswalk. 
What's my point? My point is, is that it seems to me that some people are, are, are treating each other in atrocious ways. God is not pleased with that. He's especially not pleased when Christians treat each other in these ways. Brethren, these things ought not so to be. Whether in our society or in our church, and we above all people have a reason not to be this way. How we act and interact with each other needs to be considerate always. Chapter 1 all the way through this passage is not just talking to a particular person. It's talking to all of us. And how we should interact and treat and be respectful and, and maintain the dignity of each other and how we talk to each other. Whether we're the ones in authority or the ones that are uh, to be in submission. No matter what our relationship. And even if none of us are masters and, and slaves, we know that the principles are still true across the board that we should respect one another as an act of worship to God. And so I have a series of questions for you. And I want to I wanna ask you to help you to apply this passage to yourself because you might wonder, how does this even apply to me? Well, the first application question is this. What can I know about God's will for me in this passage? So this passage comes in light of being commanded to walk in the Spirit. And I'll say it this way, to walk in the will of God. How do we know the will of God? We need to know the Word of God and we need to respond to the urging of the Holy Spirit of God when He draws us, when He moves us. What can I know from God's will, uh, about God's will for me in this passage? Is there something in there that you see that would tell you how you ought to interact with one another? Maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Secondly, can I encourage someone else in this passage? So maybe you got it down. Do you know of anybody that needs to know how to interact within their home, within their community? Needs to know how to yield to the leadership of the husband? Needs to know how to love their wife? Can you think of anybody? Is there anybody that you can say, hey, here's God's uh, outlook on how we should act towards one another? Whether in the marriage or outside of the marriage. Can I encourage someone in, uh, with this passage? Thirdly, what is my attitude towards those in authority? Again, we're in a day and age where there's very little respect for authority. I think we ought to be very careful. Whether we're talking about our president, our governor, uh, our people in leadership. Um, I've even said things at times that I had to, to ask God forgiveness for. Um, whether I think the, the governor's um, foolish, what, what have you. Um, don't send me comics and posters that mock the president, the governor. I'm not going not gonna to forward those. Maybe once in a while I'll see one that's funly, funny, but mostly not. What's your attitude towards authority? How do you feel about police? How do you feel about those who, are, who, who you work for or under? Do you have the right kind of attitude towards authority? Next. Are there some areas of change that need to take place in my life in interacting with others? What are some areas that I need to change? Have you taken an inventory of your life? Do you know what you're like? Maybe ask a few others if you don't. I'm sure they'd be glad to tell you. Next, how do I treat those under my authority? Are you kind and gentle, thoughtful? Or are you condescending, rude, and demanding? How do I treat those under my authority? And then lastly, how can I put my struggles with being mutually submiss submissive into perspective? So chapter 5, verse 21, submit to each other in the fear of God. And then we see, here's what it looks like. But some of us are on the short end of the stick, or we've gotten the short stick. And it's, it's like our life is, is a burden. And, and you wonder, how can, I, how can I go on? And I'm telling you, keep it all in perspective. Life is short. Eternity is forever. The riches of God right now are real. We have Christ. No one's ever going to take him away from us. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. He's what we have. When all is said and done, all of our earthly things can be taken away, our relationships, but we have Christ and we are rich. But it doesn't stop there. We have the riches of eternity. And we can look forward to that. Maybe when we get caught up on the struggles of life and we're mourning 
know, our loss and our struggles and our hardship and people don't like me, they don't, disres- you know, they don't respect me, life is bad, I might just as well eat worms. Maybe you ought to just take a moment to put it all in perspective that God is the one who blesses and one day he's going to bless us beyond our wildest imaginations. We need to keep it all in perspective. While some aspects of life can be very difficult, it does not compare to the riches that God has for you in eternity. So let me close with this statement. Walk in the Spirit by following God's design for submitting to each other. Let's pray. Lord God, help me as I wrestle with these things that the people I come across, whether they're over me, under me, beside me, Uh, whether they're children, whether they're adults, whether they're older adults, younger adults, people the same age, no matter what the situation, help me to interact with them in a way that would be pleasing to you. Lord, that I would discern how to live out your will, that I would understand that my decisions uh, make a difference in people's lives. Help me to make the difference you want me to make. God, please give me the strength I know you have. Guide me with your word. Strengthen me with your Holy Spirit. And help me to be pleasing to you as I try to discern what it is that you would have for me each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray. 